That's true. Um, all right, so without further ado, unless anyone needs time, let's continue with the presentation. Okay, so starting with what are ACEs? ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. And as you guys just uh, witnessed firsthand, ACEs is a survey. It refers to a survey with 10 questions originally. And the survey is meant to measure the adversity that one faces before the age of 18. And it measures this adversity um, by including questions on various forms of physical, emotional abuse and neglect. So as you saw in the questionnaire, um, there are questions such as, did you get uh, physically hurt as a child? Did you live with a parent who has substance abuse disorders? Um, any survey, there are limitations. So the survey is measuring adversity um, in a way of presence. So yes or no, whether the abuse or neglect existed, but it doesn't measure the severity. Um, so in one way, it gives us a way to measure child adversity. And in that way, it's very helpful, but it doesn't give us the whole picture. So it's just something to keep in mind as we discuss this. The original ACE study was conducted by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente in 1995. They recruited 17 participants as part of their original study. Um, presumably a representative sample was their goal. And out of that representative sample, two thirds of participants reported at least one adverse childhood experience. In later follow-up studies, that number we see is more around 80% of individuals face at least one adverse childhood experience before the age of 18. In addition to that, one in six individuals experience four or more adverse childhood experiences in their life. And so the point here is that ACEs are very common experience. We know from our California statewide CalSpeaks data um, that Daniel and I have been analyzing that around 40% of all Californians face traumatic brain injury. So when we talk about ACEs and traumatic brain injury, we're talking about issues that affect the vast majority of the population. We also should consider when talking about prevalence, intersectionality. So there's a higher prevalence of ACEs among women, minorities, LGBTQ, the prison population, low-income population, and the unhoused population. For example, 93% of all homeless people experienced one adverse childhood experience in their life. In addition to being very common, ACEs are also very costly to our healthcare system and our society. So individuals with four or more ACEs cost the healthcare system double that amount that individuals with no adverse childhood experience cost the healthcare system. And we'll see that this may come as a surprise, but the single greatest driver of cost for ACEs is cardiovascular disease, actually chronic diseases. Is what? Cardiovascular disease. So we're talking about ACEs, why do we care? So ACEs affect our health, how? So much like traumatic brain injury, ACEs leads to cognitive, emotional, and physical symptomology. So unsurprisingly, having adverse childhood experiences leads to greater risk of mood disorders. For example, like a 40% greater risk of depression. But which, what may come as more of a surprise is that ACEs also lead to physical chronic diseases. So in the table on the right, we have the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States as of 2017. And in the right column, we have the odd ratios for risk of disease for people with four or more ACEs. So if you have a score, oh, thank you. Um, so if you have a score of four or more on your ACE survey, you have double the risk of heart disease, cancer, stroke. You have triple the risk of chronic lower respiratory disease, 11 times the risk of Alzheimer's, 
increased risk for diabetes, kidney disease, 37 times the risk for suicide. We also see number three on the list, 2.6 times the risk for accidents. And that's one possible mechanism by which we see that ACEs leads to higher associated risk for traumatic brain injuries. Um, so ACEs impact our chronic disease, our mood disorders, it impacts our immune system, our epigenetics. ACEs also impacts our social determinants health, leading to higher rates of unemployment, low income, lower educational attainment. So the figure on the left is meant to illustrate that ACEs have impacts across our health and across the human race. Looking more into the association between ACEs and traumatic brain injury. So Daniel has published re research stating that people with ACEs are more likely to experience traumatic brain injury in their life. And that goes bi-directionally. So people with traumatic brain injury are also more likely to experience ACEs. Um, and we see similarities on the neurological level. So these are images of PET scans. Um, on the left, upper left, we see a person with no abuse and normal brain activation levels. And next to that, we see a person with child abuse. Um, this person was a Romanian orphan who grew up in the Romanian version of the foster care system. And in that, we see that the person who experiences child abuse has less activity. Um, in this picture, they're pointing out the temporal lobes, which are involved in memory and emotion. There's less activity in the limbic system. Amy that we talked about, which is regarding fear response. Um, so often we see among trauma survivors either an over or under activation of emotion and sensory processing. So um, in the figure to the right, okay. so in this figure here, we're looking at SPECT images. And we see that this person with PTSD, instead of an underactivation that we see in the left images, has a very overly activated brain. So people typically respond to trauma by either numbing their emotions and, and sensory processing or being in a state of hypervigilance of, oh, when is this going to happen again? And perceiving threats in their environment all the time. Um, and in a traumatic brain injury patient, we see some of the similar less activity than we do um, compared to the healthy brain. Um, down here, we see a normal brain in comparison to mild cognitive impairments. And again, we see a lack of activation in certain areas of the brain. So overall, we see, we see similar neurological changes in structure and function of the brain common to people with adverse childhood experiences and traumatic brain injury, such as neural, neuronal loss in the hippocampus, which is involved in memory. We all know that people not experience memory difficulties. Um, altered function and structure of the limbic system, the Amy that we talk about a lot, so for um, function of our fear response, we also have less activation in the prefrontal cortex, which is here, the child abuse brain compared to the no abuse brain has less red. Um, plays into our emotion um, reasoning and our decision making and impulsivity. So all of these are common symptomology and issues among people with ACEs and TBI. So, I'm making the claim that ACEs impact our health. So how exactly does that work? So this is what we call an ACE pyramid developed by the CDC. And it's meant to explain how complex trauma and ACEs lead to increased mortality or early death. So at the base of the pyramid, we have 
generational trauma, which has come up in our group before, and racial discrimination systemic factors, which both are precursors and play a role into one being born into a, a situation in which they experience ACEs. Then experiencing ACEs leads to um, under or over activation of our neural pathways and disruption in neurological development, as we saw in the last slide. This disruption in neurological development leads to the adaption, adoption of riskier behaviors and poor health lifestyle factors. So if we have less activation of our prefrontal cortex, we're more likely to make impulsive decisions, maybe drive recklessly or engage in substance abuse behavior, um, in addition to having less coping mechanisms to have a balanced diet or exercise regularly. And all this can lead to a higher risk for chronic disease burden, like we saw heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and also increased risk for accidents, which can increase our risk for traumatic brain injury, all of which are more likely to lead to early death. The interesting thing about this is that even in the absence of poor lifestyle factors and high risk behaviors, we still see a higher mortality among people. So how exactly does that work? So one mechanism to explain the increase in mortality, even in the absence of risky behaviors or poor lifestyle factors, is what we call the toxic stress response. Um, so toxic stress is differentiated from positive stress response. So evolutionarily and in today's day and age, sometimes we need to be alerted to a threat in our environment. Like evolutionarily, our ancestors were faced a lion and they had to run very quickly. It's very adaptive and beneficial to be able to mobilize our resources and our energy very quickly and run away from a threat. Um, now this stress response becomes toxic when it's chronic and all the time. So survivors of trauma had to respond to real threats in their environment and especially on, for people experiencing ACEs or chronic stress they had to respond to chronic threats, which often puts their brain in a state of hypervigilance. Um, so if we think about the autonomic nervous system and the sympathetic response, which is what activates when we um, respond to a threat in our environment, um, some of the things that happen are when we see a threat in our environment, our brain sends signals to our adrenal medulla and it releases epinephrine. And what epinephrine does in the body is one, it, um, our liver converts glycogen to glucose and releases glucose into the blood, which spikes our blood sugar. Uh, in a acute stress situation, this would give us energy to run away from the threat. But what happens when this happens all the time? then we have constantly high blood sugar, which may play into the role of increased risk for diabetes. Um, our sympathetic response leads to faster heart rate. In an acute stress situation, this allows us to run and gives us more energy um, and more blood flow. But what happens when this happens all the time? Our heart is constantly beating at an accelerated rate. We have a higher risk for heart disease. Uh, our breathing accelerates. If this is happening all the time, we have increased risk for uh, respiratory diseases. Um, we also see like vasoconstriction of blood vessels in the digestive tract. If this is happening all the time, we have digestive issues. So these are some of the common symptoms and issues we've talked about in this group um, and how our um, stress response plays a role in that, um, similar to ACEs. Okay, so we've discussed how ACEs impact our health and everyone has taken the questionnaire. So how do we interpret our total ACE score? 
So our A score is determined from the first 10 questions on the survey. Um, that survey was later expanded, which is why we had a second section. Um, but if you add up your total yeses, the total number of yeses from your original 10 questions, um, then you have a total score from zero to 10. And if you have a score from zero to three without any of the associated health conditions, so if you have a score from zero to three and you have no chronic disease, no mood disorders, and no autonomic nervous system dysregulation, then you're considered to be in the low risk category. If you have a score from one to three with associated health conditions, you're said to be in the intermediate risk category. And if you have a score of four or higher, you're high risk regardless of your health conditions. So that's one way to interpret the score that we just used. So we know our A score, we know it impacts our health. So what do we do with all this information? So the treatment approach for ACEs is similar to that for traumatic brain injury. So everything that we talk about from week to week in this group in terms of protective factors and psychotherapy, so the things that we talk about are having supportive relationships, a good support network, getting quality sleep, having balanced nutrition, getting physical exercise, mindfulness practices, the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 we talk about, journaling, breathing exercises, all those are ways of practicing mindfulness. Experiencing nature has real effects on our health and our bodies. Um, and all that, all those protective factors in combination with psychotherapy, the goal of which is often to get in touch and reintegrate our trauma into our, our person. So therapy is approached with a trauma-informed care approach, what they call, which is um, approaching the entire individual with dignity and awareness of their trauma. And it focuses on addressing symptomology with each protective factor. So treatment would be focused depending on someone's symptoms. If someone has a problem sleeping, the treatment would be focused on sleep hygiene, regular sleep schedule, et cetera, all the things that we talk about. And so how much our ACEs affect us um, is really a balance between our risk factors and our protective factors. So the more that we can increase those protective factors, the more we can tip the scale in our favor. Um, and the point of this whole discussion is to raise awareness of ACEs and how if you have traumatic brain injury, it can compound and increase the symptomology. Um, but awareness is the first key in addressing the issue. Um, so we hope that this information can make you more aware of where your symptoms are coming from so that you can then address them. So, I'll take them for any slides. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Hold on, but actually, oh yeah. Can you stop sharing so that way we can yeah, give a round of applause. Thank you very much, Victoria, for, for that uh, talk on adversity and chronic stress.